Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast, where we talk with the people behind the current events and breakthroughs in brain implants in an understandable way, helping bring together various fields involved in neuroprosthetics. Here is your host, Ladin Yurichek. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast. Today's guest is a very special guest. It is uh, Dr. Kevin Tracy of the Feinstein Institute. If you know much about bioelectronic medicine, then you really recognize this name because he's kind of the person that jump-started everything. He kind of was the one that found out the pathway between, I guess, the vagus nerve, between nerve and inflammation. So basically showing that nerves and neurons and brain cells can control much more than, I don't know, movement and, and everything like this, but like, hey, there's an actual link to inflammation. So this kind of jump started this whole field of bioelectronic medicine. And we talk a lot about bioelectronic medicine in the future and the promises, but also we have to be careful. So, you know, I get excited sometimes. Sorry, guys. <laughs> but this is a very interesting episode and the fourth interview from people over at Feinstein Institute. So uh, yeah, they become kind of a favorite of mine. <laughs> so enjoy. So Kevin Tracy, pleasure to have you on the show. It's actually kind of amazing that that uh, you haven't been on the show yet because you know this has been going on for a few years, three years now. You are kind of the father of bioelectronic medicine. I mean, you kind of were the one that figured out that, hey, the vagus nerve has an effect on inflammation and it has more than an effect on muscles and everything like this, but actually, you know, the immune system as well. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, what you're known for and then I guess what you've been doing now? Uh, well, first, it's a pleasure to be here. I really am ha happy to be uh, joining you today. What happened was that we took sort of a concept of developing therapies for people based on drugs that, that I've been working on for, I don't know, 15 years. And with a background in neurosurgery, I began thinking about applying this as a question of neuroscience or neuromodulation instead of drug development. And, you know, as, like a lot of good stories in science, this this happened by accident. Um, so what are, what are we known for? I think we're known for putting the concept of targeting drugs through molecular mechanisms or drug targets through molecular mechanisms into the language of neuroscience. And that allows us to think about using this, this neural language to control drug, drug targets as a way of, of having design specifications to make new devices. And, and so at a very simple level, we provided a, a basic science construct that enables biomedical engineers and, and neuromodulating engineers to, to build devices to target nerves to control drug targets. Interesting. So how is this possible? How can neurostimulators be similar to drugs? Like how can drug targets and the brain, how, how's, that, how's that related? They can, they can use the same process the pharmaceutical industry has used for uh, 120 years. So what do I mean by that? If you want to make a therapy for a disease in the pharmaceutical industry, you start with picking the disease, and then you dissect the disease or identify a molecular target in the disease that you wish to pursue. With that done, you then screen for molecules to hit the target to treat the disease, find the least toxic molecule that hits the target and sell it. And that's the basis of the pharmaceutical industry for 120 years since Paul Ehrlich thought it up when he was recovering from his own bad case of tuberculosis. What we've done is apply the same principle to neuroscience, to neuromodulation. And we did this by, by asking a very simple question. The drug target we were interested in is, is TNF made by the immune system. And after many years of work, my colleagues and I showed that overproduction of TNF causes too much inflammation in diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and Crohn's disease and septic shock and, and, and others. So we got to thinking, before we thought of bioelectronic medicine, we got to thinking, if, if, if too much TNF is so dangerous, what are the evolutionary control mechanisms that prevent the TNF from being overproduced normally in healthy people or healthy subjects? We realize that health is maintained in other organ systems like the cardiovascular system through reflex circuits that receive information about the status of the system and then 
process that information and then send controlling signals back to that organ to keep homeostasis. We got to thinking, is it possible that the that, that similar reflexes operate to control the the immune system and the production of TNF? And we we did the experiments, and what what we found over over many many years was that we could trace signals traveling in a few fibers of the vagus nerve, which of course is a hundred thousand fibers or so in people. A few thousand fibers or less control the the function of the immune system in the spleen, and and these signals arriving in the spleen turn off the production of TNF. And and really, once we understood that, we began to design, imagine, conceive clinical trials that could test the theory. What's so powerful about bioelectronic medicine, as, as I just proposed it, which is beginning with the molecular target, mapping the neural circuits to control the target, and then building devices to control the nerve to control the target. What's so powerful about that story is it's it's scalable and it's replicable, and it generates testable hypotheses. Rather than sort of randomly building a device and sticking in a bunch of animals or people and seeing what happens, you pick the target first, and you discern or discover the mechanisms controlling the target, and then you build the device. And so we did that, and we've now done a series of clinical trials by a company I co-founded called Setpoint, which is led all the trials under the current leadership of great people like the CEO, Murthy, and the um, CMO, Dr. Chernoff. And what we're seeing is that patients who, who have diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and Crohn's disease, many of them have gone into remission when we turned on this, this reflex circuit in the vagus nerve called the inflammatory reflex. Wow, that's incredible. That's really why I love bioelectronic medicine because it's more targeted and it's more, I guess, precise. It's less of a blunt object than the pharmaceuticals, you know, drugs flooding your entire body with, you know, some kind of chemical in order to get a specific effect. This is like very targeted. You want to turn it on, boom, you turn it on. You want to turn it off, you turn it off. So uh, do you want to talk a little bit about Setpoint and what it does? Um, well, can I respond to what you just said first? Because you just said some, you just said a couple of things that are very, very important that I think that are commonly mentioned and not often well understood. So, so the power of the targeting the nerve to control the the disease, if you will, or treat the subject, is that millions and millions of years of evolution have retained these nervous system based or neuroscientific control mechanisms on very complex processes at the level of individual cells. And the way nerves work is they send a short-term signal to mediate an effect, um, either maintaining homeostasis or correcting a, a deviation from, from a set point. And this effect is short-lived. Neurotransmitters operate in seconds to minutes, and action potentials, of course, on a much shorter time frame than that. And so, so what you have is you have a very you have a very specialized ability to fine tune control the target if you know where it is and what you want to do. And so that's, as you pointed out correctly, that's very different than drugs. So the temporal feature gives you tremendous control. The second feature that you mentioned is incredibly important is that because nerves are anatomically restricted to a particular domain or region and act, you know, potentially at the level of an individual cell or at best at a, at a group of cells or a, a region of tissue, not the whole body. If you understand your target and you understand where it is and you understand how the target is innervated, you can literally treat the disease without having, as you would with a drug, you, you put the, the drug in the body, it goes everywhere. And so the limiting factor of essentially all drugs is side effects and toxicity. Now, devices can obviously have side effects. I'm not saying devices can't have side effects. But the, the side effect profile of a device on a specific nerve going to a specific body part is certainly much easier to understand, manage, and control than the side effect of putting a few milligrams of a potentially toxic drug into your bloodstream and hoping it goes where you want it to go and doesn't cause problems somewhere else. So, so the points you raised very briefly are incredibly important to bioelectronic medicine. I could not agree with you more. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's that's why it's so exciting. And I mean, because of that, too, because it's not like this whole systemic effect, it's potentially much easier to get through the FDA and to get approved because it's just like, well, there's fewer variables, right? Well, yes and no. I mean, the FDA does what the FDA does. They're charged with making sure that 
devices that are deployed are safe and effective, and these regulatory processes work their course to the best of, of the ability of the FDA and, and best guise of protecting patients and, and optimizing efficacy. So I, I can't really speak to the FDA uh, on how they, how they do this. I'm not an expert on that. I can speak to the fact that in the case of the inflammatory reflex, you can actually have systemic effects as well. So from targeting a specific nerve. So what do I mean by that? So the signals in the vagus nerve when you target the fibers that go to the spleen, lead to the release in the spleen of a neurotransmitter from the splenic nerve called norepinephrine. And the norepinephrine in the spleen controls uh, about 1% or 2% of the T cells in the spleen, which respond to the presence of norepinephrine, and these T cells, in, in response, make acetylcholine. Now, if you, if you measure the acetylcholine coming out of the spleen, it's coming from the T cells. And we've done all these experiments. And, and what you see is that the acetylcholine will come out of the spleen for hours after a few minutes or less of, of electrical stimulation of the vagus nerve. So what you're seeing is a massive amplification effect of the acetylcholine coming out of the spleen, which now goes into the bloodstream, and the T cells, which are making the acetylcholine, which are anti-inflammatory, and they go into the bloodstream. And so what's happening is that the, the action potentials that start in the brainstem or the, in, in the case of an artificially implanted vagus nerve stimulator start in the neck, those action potentials go from the brainstem or the neck down to the spleen and lead to the release of T cells, which are now in the bloodstream, causing protection or healing of, of uh, blocking inflammation and inducing healing because they make acetylcholine. And so now you can have arthritis in your elbow, which is not innervated by the vagus nerve, but it's going to derive the benefit of the cells that have been released from the spleen. You really have to understand these mechanisms to understand what to follow in the clinical trial and, and what to expect from the, from the long-term outcomes. It, it, these are really important points that you're making. It's, it's like it's a whole system. It's like it's a whole interconnected thing. It's not just like, I don't know, uh, podiatrists, foot doctors is like no. It, it involves the whole. It involves the whole body. Okay, so so let's let's talk a little bit about Setpoint. I'm very curious about this. What have you guys been up to there? So you'll have to ask them about that. I am. I'm not an employee of Setpoint. I'm not on the board of Setpoint. I am a consultant to Setpoint, and I help them when they when they want me to help them. But I really can't speak to the company. What I can say, and I'll pause here for a second. I am a co-founder of Setpoint. I co-founded it with my colleague from Harvard, Shaw Warren, um, some years ago. And the reason to, to start the company was to establish a mechanism to test the idea that it would be possible to harness the inflammatory reflex in human clinical trials. This was a major undertaking that required this company, Setpoint Medical, to build a device that could be implanted in, in patients that could control the inflammatory reflex to turn off TNF and, and stop inflammation. Um, the company's now successfully completed several clinical trials. The early European trials in rheumatoid arthritis and Crohn's disease showed tremendous promise in putting um, patients with severe illness into sig significantly improved clinical outcomes, some in remission, actually. And uh, most recently, last year, the company announced the findings of their first in man clinical trials using a very small device which which they had developed it's it's really cool it's about the size of a fish oil pill and it's fully contained it has the battery the asic the uh, leads and the antenna to communicate with the tablet so so the doctor can control it in, in their office and uh, and this device appeared to be uh, to function quite well and it it accomplished its, its quote unquote phase 1 uh, in, in man. And, and currently the company is, um, I, I hope, will be starting the next, the next larger clinical trial for rheumatoid arthritis in the United States. So it's a very exciting time for this. What I love about Setpoint is the name because this goes back a long time, 20 years when Sean and I were, were wondering what to call this company. And, and we just love the name Setpoint because th the whole premise is that the, the, the brainstem and the, and the nerve the nervous system, the primitive brain and the, and the nervous system operate to control organ homeostasis around set points. Now, what's funny about the name is we don't completely still even understand what the set point is, but we know there must be one. 
and all the data now point to the fact that stimulating the motor arm of this inflammatory reflex normalizes the set point in these patients. So things are going really well. <laughs> that's uh, that's funny. Like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll call it we'll call it this, but uh, we actually don't know what it is. <laughs> Usually, as you probably know, founders of a company name the company, and then it gets changed at least twice before the name. But this name actually stuck. So, so Sean and I are very happy about that. So okay, so this fish oil size capsule, it has to be implanted into the body, right? And and wrapped around the nerve, or how does it work? It's it's really cool how it works. It does have to be implanted. You're correct but it doesn't have to be wrapped around the nerve. It Imagine, as I said, a, a small fish oil capsule, and it sits on top of the nerve, and the leads are embedded into the bottom of the, of the device. So the device and the leads are sitting on the nerve, and then they're encased in a, in a small wrapper that looks, looks like a pea pod. So the device is the pea, and the wrapper is the pea pod, and the surgeon puts one stitch through the top of the pea pod to hold it together, and it's done, one and done. The nice thing about this is because you're not wrapping anything around the nerve, you're you're reducing the, the trauma to the nerve potentially, which is significant, of course. And very importantly, in the animal studies that have been done so far, you can cut the stitch and pop the thing out. It's not all scarred in. So this is this is really a, a really neat device. How specific, how how targeted can you get with this? I mean, the vagus nerve, as, as you said, is 100,000 100, fibers. You have to get to the specific fibers. Do you just kind of shut down the whole vagus nerve, or do you are you able to localize into the, the place that you want? This, this is a, inc another incredibly important question that it's just not well, and most people completely get this wrong, so I'm glad you asked. So, and I'm just speaking about data that's in the public domain, published by by Setpoint, published by my lab, and, and now replicated by other labs. What we know is that the when you stimulate uh, the vagus nerve, there are many, many fibers. And for instance, if you put in a, a high amount of current, say, I don't know, 5 milliamps or 4 milliamps, you'll slow the heart. But because you'll stimulate the fibers at that high current, you'll stimulate the fibers that, that, that slow the heart. But if you put in a few hundred microamps, you don't slow the heart uh, because the, the fiber, you haven't, you haven't put in enough charge in this complicated 100,000 fiber nerve. You haven't put in a sufficient charge to stimulate the fibers that control the heart. But those few hundred microamps is sufficient to stimulate the fibers that control the spleen and the TNF in the spleen. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what's already happened in, in clinical trials. By, by putting in relatively low amounts of current, in these people with inflammatory diseases, we're seeing, we're seeing significant benefit and we're not seeing cardiac side effects. So what does that mean? If you take, it, if you take the question to the lab, you can actually show, and we're estimating currently, the number of fibers in the vagus nerve of the 100,000 fibers in a human or 80,000 in a mouse, the number of fibers that control the signal to the splenic nerve is probably less than 5%, maybe much less. So even though, you know, there's a lot of talk and a lot of interest, and, and it's justified, there should be talk and interest about making new devices that target individual um, nerve fibers or very, very small devices that can be placed right at a specific organ. Those things are, those things are interesting and important, and they will be done and should be done. But we're already having, with what we know already, we're having effects that are not non-specific. We are by by dialing the current down, we are able to target the spleen uh, and not other organs. And so th this is really important, and it's not well understood. Most people, most people not in the field, think the vagus nerve is a solid copper wire, and and, and it's not. It's a it's more like a transatlantic cable that has a hundred thousand wires in it, and and in some ways it's more like a fiber optic cable because I think some of those individual fibers can carry multiple multiple signals at the same time or multiple television multiple television shows on the same fiber optic cable so so the specificity question comes up all the time and yes it will be nice someday to have to have even more understanding of the of the fiber specificity but right now we have a pretty good understanding that we're only talking about a small number of fibers and these fibers have to be stimulated to turn off the TNF um, and you guys are using a cuff electrode, which kind of wraps around the nerve, right? So, no, 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 no. okay, no, it's. A, I'll say it again. the 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 electrode 
is built into the fish oil capsule. Okay. I guess I'm looking at this Feinstein Institute, uh, what you guys announced at NANS uh, 2020, uh, just now about the 90 day usage of mice, VNS, something like that. So maybe, maybe that's confusing to two of your organizations, I guess. So you're, you're speaking to a project that, that Feinstein announced uh, recently at NANS. And this, this project's actually really important because there's, there's a lot of work to be done uh, in bioelectronic medicine that requires mechanistic understanding of the drug target and the relationship of the drug target to the nerve. And you can't do all that mechanistic work in humans. And the field has been slowed down. The field of bioelectronic medicine has has been slowed significantly by the absence of widely available tools like implantable leads for mice. And it's actually incredibly important to, to work out these molecular mechanisms in mice. Mice are the coin of the realm for understanding molecular mechanisms because you can man- manipulate the, the genetics of the mouse, you can manipulate the disease targets in the mouse, and the, the mice give credible, broadly accepted mechanistic evidence based in hard science that forms a foundation which you have to have, you know, you, you made reference early in, the, in our talk today to why bioelectronic medicine is so exciting to everybody. W- one reason is because you really have to understand the mechanism. These devices are becoming more like, more like drugs. In other words, you're going to put it in this patient why to do what, and how are you going to know it's working, as opposed to let's put it in the patient and turn it on and see if it works which was sort of, you know, the original model of, of a lot of, a lot of neuromodulation devices. So, so that, that, that train has left the station and it's not going back. The big advances in bioelectronic medicine today and going forward will come from understanding molecular mechanisms. And we need, we need mouse experiments to do that. Yeah. The bar has been raised. It's not, no longer like a wild west, like, wow, this, this does something. It's more like, okay, you've proven it. Okay. Now for the next step, put on the big boy panties. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. And that's what, you know, that's the challenge now. You know, we've published our findings in, uh, in journals in peer reviewed journals that allow people to replicate these mechanisms and these, and these insights in their own lab and to test them and to move the knowledge further. And then what that does is it opens, it opens the world to a much larger audience than than just the engineers building devices. Uh, now you've engaged. Now you've engaged scientists in cancer and in diabetes, and in and in autoimmune disease and in other uh, asthma, pulmonary disease, and and now these the it's a much bigger it's a much bigger playing field. And that's what you want, right? You don't want to be the only pizza parlor in town. You really want to have two or three pizza parlors in town. They compete, and you end up with a better product, and you end up with more. Uh, with more attention around the product. And that's really, bioelectronic medicine is at a tipping point right now. And, and what's going to drive it is going to be continued excellence in discovering scientific mechanisms and in continued success in clinical trials. That's what's going to drive it. The patients will demand this. It won't, it's not the marketplace. It's the patients that will demand this. Yeah, really. I mean, you know, there's so many advantages to bioelectronic medicine and it's like it really it's it's a no-brainer, I would say. Like if you can get it to work very well or better than pharmaceuticals like it's it's really not even a question. So, actually, what is the efficacy like? Have you has, does it work 100% of the time? I mean, even drugs don't work 100% of the time or I don't know, there's there's kind of complications or something like this. What's what's the effectiveness of uh your guys' stimulators? Yeah, I, I appreciate your enthusiasm, but we do have to we do have to point out for the audience that this is still early. This is still early in this field. This is still a brand new field, and although I've been working on it for twenty years uh, or more, this new field is new in terms of clinical testing and clinical adoption. And there's we don't know how we don't know if it's going to be better than this drug or that drug, and we don't know the safety profile of all the new devices, and we don't know which diseases will be amenable to treatment by this. This is still very early. The, the clinical trials that have been done have only involved a couple hundred patients at most worldwide. That's everybody all together. And so we have thousands of patients to go before we can say some of the things you, you just implied. We have to be careful that we don't, that we don't over-promise and, un, and under-deliver. The potential is there. I agree with the potential is there, but there's a lot of work to do still. But we've learned a lot also. So what we've seen in the first patients is you're absolutely right. Not, 
not every patient gets better. And we would never expect anything to uh, be 100% effective. There's a lot of reasons for this. Two patients look like they both have the same disease, could have uh, different reasons for that disease, different mechanisms, different genetic backgrounds underlying the disease. So you have variability in the disease itself. You have variability in the nervous system between patients. So you may put the device on the same part of the nerve, but it could it could have a, a wildly different effect in one patient's nerve versus another patient's nerve. So so there's a lot of variables, and we and we still don't know. Uh, and there's a lot of research going on in this here at the Feinstein Institute and elsewhere. We still don't know for sure all of the right parameters, how to what what electronic settings to put uh, on, in these devices to to maximize the effect. So you've got those are three the basis. Right there, that's just three, and there's more. But those are three big variables that are built into the clinical assessment right now. But putting that aside for a minute, what we've learned already, knowing that we've got more to learn, is that patients seem to, uh, if they, for, with arthritis and uh, in particular, if the responders seem to have significant benefit within the first week of being stimulated, and it and it seems like the biggest, the best clinical response, probably three quarters of the patients are in patients who are treated, have never been treated with biologic agents. They've only been treated with steroids or methotrexate. And we don't know why that is. We don't know if it's because they're earlier in their disease or if there's some other confounding variable. But the other thing we know is that between a third and a half of the patients who have been treated with biologics and not had good clinical responses will respond to the vagus nerve uh, stimulation to turn on their inflammatory reflex. So, so we're seeing significant clinical responses in between half and three quarters of the patients altogether. And one, one other thing that came out that's really interesting is work out of, out of Stockholm in uh, Sweden, led by Michael Ebertson at the Karolinska Institute with SetPoint. They found that patients who had previously failed all the available drugs and had a vagus nerve implant and then did not have a very good response to the vagus nerve implant when they added the drugs back in to those same patients with vagus nerve stimulation, many of them responded now. So there was something about the combination of the device plus the drug. So there's a tremendous amount we have to learn before we can say these devices will be better than these drugs. But personally, I think someday that will happen. We can't say it scientifically based on evidence yet. Yeah, this is something I heard as well that that kind of this this harmony, this this working together, the the drugs and the stimulator, is is much better. And does that work in all of the cases, or that that increases the effectivity uh, of it, or is that a certain subset of cases that that the combination works better? The numbers are small, but it's uh, you'd have to say it was a subset, but it's a it's a subset of a subset, right? So the the trial was done. In, in order to see if you implant the patients with a vagus nerve stimulator after they failed drugs, would they get better? And some did, great, and then some didn't. And then the ones that didn't, they then received supplemental drugs and now did. So there's a lot. The numbers are too small to make conclusions, but it's certainly, from a scientific or, or clinical research point of view, it's it's fascinating. Okay, so you've been focusing on the vagus nerve. Uh, do you think there's any, and, and that obviously is a very important nerve in the body, and it kind of regulates all the autonomic system. Do you think there's a potential for other nerve systems or other places that will be integrated? Because this is mostly in the neck, right? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not focused on the vagus nerve because I, because I think it's the most important. Uh, we're focused on the vagus nerve because during the course of studying uh, the production of TNF during inflammation, we found most of it came from the spleen, and 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 that this could be controlled by the vagus nerve. And so we've been we've been pursuing the vagus nerve pathways to optimize our understanding of the underlying mechanism. So we now, for most recently, we've we've actually used optogenetics to stimulate brainstem nuclei, specific brainstem nuclei, and we can now target specific neurons in the brainstem, just a handful, uh, to turn on with a, under the control of a laser light, which turns on the vagus nerve fibers that project to the celiac ganglion in the abdomen, which control the splenic nerve, which then can turn off the TNF. So we've gotten, we've gotten the precision of these signaling mechanisms down to a few neurons and a few molecules, which is unbelievable. It's really interesting. And what, by, by focusing on the vagus nerve at the Feinstein Institute, we're building the the tools 
and the knowledge base to apply that to other nerves. We're very interested in a number of other nerves, and we have active research programs looking at the nerves controlling other organs like the pancreas and the liver and the lungs and the kidney. The, the, but the principles are the same. It's not about the vagus nerve being the vagus nerve. It's about neurons in the brainstem controlling fibers that project, that project to the body's organs to control the activity of specific cells. And to the extent that you understand the steps involved that I just listed, you can apply that to other diseases in other organs, whether the vagus nerve goes there or not. And that's actually interesting that you guys are having, uh, I will, I'm very happy that you guys are having that success with the optogenetics. I was going to say, like, could you target closer to the spleen, be able to have theoretically more targeted stuff uh, that, that affects only the spleen? But it seems like you guys are able to do this even from the brain. What, what, what would be the advantages and disadvantages of both? So there are folks working on around the world on putting electrodes in the specific organ to be close to the organ and to uh, target the signaling in that way. And the advantage there is that you can be close to the organ and, and, you, and you can target the signal close to the organ, and that's fine. And that, that, may, that may come to pass someday. The disadvantage to that approach is that some of these organs are very difficult to access and surgically implanting anyways can be quite challenging in the area of the pancreas and the, and the liver and, and the spleen. Um, these organs are, are, are buried under very vascular tissue and intestines that some surgeons don't like to, to mess with. So the surgical approaches to these organs will be important in determining what kind of device you're able to put on if you choose to put your device near the organ. The advantage, again, as I said, is that you, you, if you know the, the nerve is going in the organ and you know which fibers you want to stimulate in that nerve, then you, can, then you can work with that very well if you can get the device to the nerve. The uh, disadvantage of the brain is it's the brain. And, and you, in, with our current technologies of deep brain stimulation, uh, it's done every day in every major hospital in the world, deep brain stimulation and deep brain implants. With current technology, it's difficult to imagine going forward with any sort of clinical trials, implanting someone's brain to treat their body. But as the devices get smaller, and our knowledge of human neuroanatomy and the circuits that, that I just said we're mapping in mice today with optogenetics, as our knowledge of these, of these circuits becomes more refined, and, our, and as our ability to do brain stimulation, either with you know, vanishingly small electrodes that are safe and almost non-invasive, um, you can imagine a day where where we would be stimulating the brain because then you'll know exactly the origin of the fibers that can control the effect in the body, which is precisely what you want. And of course, there's the other alternative that there's a lot of interest in developing brain stimulators that don't need surgical implants. And so again, in the future, as the precision of those increases and, and as our knowledge of, of human neuroanatomy and of these circuits in the brain increases, I, I could imagine a day when, when targeting these things would be feasible. It's not feasible today. It's years away. One day, one day. So I kind of want to finish up with uh, what you're doing at the Feinstein Institute. Do you want to talk a little bit about the Feinstein Institute? You've helped build this up. I've had a lot of people on there. Uh, Chad Bowton, uh, Theo Zanos, Lauren Reith. <laughs> here, I, I guess you're the fourth, fourth person from this institute. Why do I have so many people <laughs> on the Neural Implant Podcast from, from this institute? The Feinstein Institute, which I'm the president and CEO of, we stood up a, a new institute for bioelectronic medicine currently led by Yusuf Alabed. And we recruited these world-class people that you've mentioned uh, and others. And the mission of the, of the Feinstein Institute for Bioelectronic Medicine is to um, produce the knowledge necessary in bioelectronic medicine to cure disease. And so we have brought together some of the best people in the world who think about what you and I have just been talking about for the last uh, half hour which is, you know, what do we have to know about the molecular mechanisms in the disease in the disease pathogenesis side of the story? What do we have to know about the neuroscience and the neural control of these molecular targets? And then what do we have to build based on, on what we learn with these design specifications? What do we have to build to make devices to control the nerve, to control the target? And because we stood up this institute a few years ago with, uh, with this very focused mission, 
it's it's a place where people come to collaborate. You know, it's not a siloed place. We don't have the engineering department over there and the neuroscience department over here and the molecular medicine department over there. We're all together in this. And the expertise overlaps. And that gives us tremendous, uh, well, it's fun. It's tremendously fun. Uh, but it also gives us uh, tremendous opportunities to innovate and explore uh, important questions in this space. We've had, we've been, we've been sort of catalyzed with very important strategic collaborations with GE. And we published a paper in Nature Communications, I think it was last year, looking at using ultrasound to stimulate the neural control of inflammation and glucose metabolism in the liver. Um, we've looked at with United Therapeutics, uh, we've got a big program looking at the role of neuro, neuromodulation and bioelectronic medicine in pulmonary hypertension. And with the uh, other strategic partners that don't want to be mentioned, uh, we have programs looking at Alzheimer's disease. And, uh, and these are very, very exciting projects. They're very big projects. We're very, very pleased with our progress. We've got a ways to go. We're growing. We're going to launch 13 new labs next year, I hope. The construction has begun. And um, we're very, very excited. The, the Feinstein Institute, I should say, is, is part of the, the Northwell health system in New York. Northwell Health is is a what $13 billion not-for-profit company. It's the largest healthcare provider in New York City and New York State. And we are the home for research in this in this very big uh, and important health system. We we have four other institutes besides bioelectronic medicine. We have institutes looking at cancer research, health outcomes research, behavioral health and psychiatry. And, uh, and molecular medicine. And each of those is led by world-class people. So it's a very exciting place. Wow. That's incredible. 13 new labs. That's crazy. And that, that's all going to be in New York though, right? Yes. All in New York. Wow. Incredible. And so you're going to be focusing on these, uh, maybe other disease targets or other ways of, um, I don't know, like the computation side of things, or I don't know, the physical design side of things, or, or what are these? Do, do you know anything about these labs? All of the above. We're focusing on all the above. Our labs, are, our labs are working actively on identifying the neural control of other drug targets and other diseases. We're looking at information processing in the nerves to understand how to optimize the signals. We've all spent a lot of time looking at the motor or outgoing signals to the organ. We're spending a lot of time now looking at the incoming or sensory signals and how those control the outgoing signals. Uh, we're identifying previously unrecognized um, neurons that control very important aspects of the immune response, including the response to vaccines, which of course is very timely with this coronavirus epidemic. You know, we, it, we're, we're trying to understand if it's possible to develop bioelectronic control of vaccine development. So, so we've got a lot of projects and a lot of great people. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm I'm a bit behind on the the podcast episodes, so with the coronavirus stuff, either it'll all be over or we'll all be dead by the time this episode comes out. <laughs> I don't think we'll all be dead, but I don't think it'll be over. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dr. Kevin Tracy, this has been excellent. Uh, is there anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to mention? I think we covered it all. I I, I would just urge people to when they talk about bioelectronic medicine, just just focus on understanding me mechanisms. If we understand the mechanisms uh, of the disease and we link it to the mechanisms of how the nerve nerves work, and then we link it to the mechanisms of how the devices control the signal and the nerves, then the world will be a better place. And then under promise and over deliver. <laughs> Absolutely. Because there's so much excitement about this right now. And, and yes, there's been a lot of good news, but we have a long ways to go. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Dr. Kevin Tracy, thank you so much. Thank you. Nice talking to you. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new, bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.